We are continuing our discussion this week on the basics of sugar. And I'm sorry that it took me a little bit longer than I had planned. I was stuck at the auto place getting my car, um, the oil changed, and they took a lot longer than they said they would, but as is life. So here we are. So last week, uh, we talked about fructose and how it's not really good for us because we don't have that beep, beep, beep signal in our brain that tells us to stop eating it. Um, I'm getting full, turn off now, it's time to stop eating it. So we mentioned fruit. Well, there's fructose and fruit gin, so what am I supposed to do about that? Continue eating fruit, please, please eat fruit. It's very good for you. So I'm kind of basically um, of the mind frame that if it's natural, you know, if it is grown in the ground, if it's grown on a tree, you know, then, it, then it's good for you. So that's not a problem. Now, what does fruit offer even though it has fructose in it? It offers an array of other things. So the fructose is not real high on the anti-fruit category because it offers phytochemicals, fiber, vitamins, minerals, and all of these things slow down the processing in your body so the fructose is not, you know, really bad, okay? So that's how we're uh, working on fruit and fructose. So for the rest of today, we are going to be talking about can sugars be hidden and uh, how is it affecting our kiddos? I know tomorrow is Halloween. We're all getting excited and ramped up. Normally Halloween is kind of like the kickoff for the sugar season and it doesn't end until February. So um, I lost my place. It's cool. It's cool. I'll find it. Okay. Can sugars be hidden? Basically the answer is no because they have to report it on the nutrition label of your foods. The ominous they, they have to put it all in front of you on the label. The problem is, is that we don't know how much is natural and how much is added. They aren't differentiating between the two. So what are we supposed to do? Basically, I would suggest trying to eat as many natural things as possible and less packaged things. So when you read a package and it has a specific amount of sugars, you also need to look at the nutri um, at the ingredients, not only the nutrition label, but the ingredient list to see if there's any sugars added to it. And you need to be really smart here because there's like 50 or 70 different names for sugar so they can kind of hide it in other ways. So just pay attention to your labels, okay? So now how is sugar affecting our children? Um, basically, the same way that it's affecting you and I. The only problem is, is that they are much younger and they're starting much earlier. So the first um, artificial sweetener came around in like 1879 by accident. Um, and they didn't start like ramping it up, using it in a lot of foods until like the 1980s, 1990s. So up in, from then up until now, we have seen an increase in artificial sweeteners used in lots of lots of things. So our children are being exposed to it a lot earlier in life and a lot more of it. So weight gain and type two diabetes has been um, linked to the consumption of a lot of excess sugar in children. Um, so what are we supposed to do? Um, basically, they are, what am I doing? I'm getting lost here. Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. Sorry, <laughs> I was reading my notes. <laughs> so because of those two things, weight gain and type two diabetes, what can we do? We, well, they learn from us. Um, one, they are either genetically predisposed, or two, they learn their habits from their parents. We are with our children like 24 hours a day, basically until they go to school. And even when they're at school, we still have the opportunity to pack their lunches. I have packed both my kids' lunches from day one of school, and I personally take pride in that because I can, you know, within reason, make sure that they're eating what they should be eating. Um, I actually took the time 
to add up on a, on a daily basis, not every single day, but on a daily basis, how much sugar my kids are consuming. And it really was not as much as I thought. Like I was actually like patting myself on the back a little bit. Um, now, like I said, that's on a normal, regular daily basis. Um, but I kind of view it as God entrusted me with these children and I, I am now charged with making them to be good citizens, to be good people, and also taking care of them and making sure that they learn how to take care of themselves, therefore teaching them good habits. So what are we supposed to do if we're going to prevent, maybe do some redirecting and maybe a little bit of retraining? So before I get started in this, if you know me personally at all um, and my family, you know my children are like the pickiest eaters in the world. Oh my gosh, so picky. So even though they are picky, I'm still really particular about what they eat and I don't know, I just, um, I just try really hard to make sure that they're getting what they need, even if they are picky. So I'll give you an example of a regular day um, for lunch. My daughter, I will make a whole week's worth of um, chicken in the crock pot. Uh, she eats green beans. She will have a fruit, which is either like grapes or raisins. Um, and then she might have some crackers on the side, something like that. Um, my son, a little bit different. He'll eat like a sandwich. I use Ezekiel bread for him. Um, he actually will eat it, so I do use it. And then um, turkey, and then he also eats like corn, green beans, something like that. He'll eat apples, bananas. Um, so I try to make sure that they have a food from each food group. And so that's one place to start. So another place to start is maybe getting them involved in some of the cooking that you do. Um, if you get them in the kitchen and let them help out, let them try it at the end, that is definitely one thing um, that, I, that I think little kids get excited about, so they're much more willing to try it if they've been involved. Um, second thing is maybe just switching some things out really slowly, like maybe changing an applesauce to an apple. And then uh, soda. Soda. Okay, we're gonna take a pause right here about soda. If you know me, I am a major soda hater. There is absolutely nothing in it that is worth anything for you. I will, okay, I will give it one pro. One pro is that it helps towards hydration, just keeping you hydrated. Otherwise, it has a bunch of junk in it that you don't need. So, if you were feeding your children soda, stop it, stop it right now, stop it. Okay. Done with the soapbox. Okay, so now that my soapbox session is over, I'm gonna give you four tips on how to keep the sugar slash candy, as tomorrow is Halloween, at bay in your house. Number one, let the kids have fun. Let them dress up, let them eat their candy, but kind of limit what they're eating, just a couple of pieces, maybe five pieces. You don't have to go crazy, it is a fun night. You know, don't ruin the fun, but don't let them sit there and eat an entire bucket full of candy either. Um, number two, keep the candy out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, especially if you have little kids. Um, number three, maybe like limit it to one piece per day. Um, I personally wait until dinner time before I let my kids have their piece if they request it. Um, just because at school, there's a lot of times they'll get treats already, like somebody's birthday and they show up with cupcakes or even now like Halloween, the teachers give them a bunch of candy. Um, also some teachers have a reward system for candy, pick something out of the treasure box and it is candy. Um, so I try hard just to, you know, like once they get home, hey, what have you had at school today? Did you get any treats? That kind of thing. So I can kind of limit, um, limit the sugar intake. Um, and then my fourth tip for you is um, because I said Hall uh, Halloween is the start of the candy season all the way through February, we have so many holidays that are centered around candy, throw the previous holiday out. So you have all this Halloween candy, keep it until Thanksgiving. And then if you get Thanksgiving candy, 
throw the Halloween candy out and then replace it with the Thanksgiving candy. And then after Thanksgiving, then of course you have Christmas. So throw the Thanksgiving candy out and put in the Christmas. So that way you're not just adding piles and piles and piles of candy. And then by the time the end of Valentine's day rolls around, you've got like this massive amount of candy. What am I supposed to do with all of this? So if you don't want to throw it out, give it to a good home, someone else who wants candy. Um, I usually send it to my husband's office. I don't keep it in my house. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for being patient with me. I'm sorry that we were a little late on the ball today, but enjoy your four uh, tips, and I will see you next week, maybe Wednesday and Friday, too. All right, guys, see you later.